you hear us now? We're going to do a quick sound check. We apologize for the technical difficulties. Are people able to hear us? Are you getting any responses? Um, no one's watching it yet. All right. All right. We are here to tell you a little bit about some amazing mammals. They are one of the largest groups, the second largest groups of mammals, second only to rodents. And we are here to tell you about them because there are lots and lots of wild species in Alberta and some of them make them their home right here at the Calgary Zoo. So I'm just checking in with our sound tech here and it looks like we are good to go. Everyone can hear us. Excellent. All right. Welcome to, fa uh, to all our Facebook viewers right now. We are the visitor engagement team, two members of it. My name is Sarah Smith and this is my colleague Lara Hiles. I'm particularly excited to present this little bat program with Lara because she is researching bats at U of C right now. In fact, she just won an award for her research. And part of that work is stuff that she's doing right here on zoo grounds with some of the wild bats that make their home here. One thing we've noticed lots of our visitors aren't aware of, this zoo is fabulous wild habitat. We're right down next to the river. So water, that's a really important thing for all animals. And of course, we've got all these fabulous mature trees and parkland. So that makes us really good urban forest habitat. And that means lots of bats will like to make their home here because of course, if you are a bat, you are looking for a place where there's lots of bugs and lots of bugs live in the water and rise up off of it, particularly at dusk. So this is a great place to find these species. Oh yes. Now, Lara, you are an actual scientist. I am. Doing research on bats. And I would classify myself as a mad scientist. Someone who really enjoys changing humans into other species just to show the difference of the incredible adaptations we can find in nature. And today, I have a very special victim, I mean volunteer, to introduce to you. Here is a young visitor who has agreed to help us out to show us the difference between humans and bats. This is Toby. Toby, how are you doing today? Good. Were you expecting to be changed into a bat today? Well, when you told me, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> now, <laughs> if Toby extends his wings for us, you can see why we decided he was going to make a pretty great bat volunteer. Look at this kid's awesome shirt. Let's hang with a bat. Very cool. All right. To get off the ground on your own steam, to achieve flight, you bats are a completely separate type of animal. They're a mammal. We can tell that Toby the bat is a mammal because he has fur or hair instead of feathers. He also makes his own body heat. So he's changing the energy from the food he eats into the heat he needs to keep his body at a constant temperature, just like we do. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a really important thing. If Toby was going to try to get off the ground just by flapping his own little human arms, he would not be able to push enough air to do so. He needs the special bat wing. So, Lara, can you tell us what order are bats? What's the name of them? So bats are in the order Chiroptera, which can translate to hand wing. That's right. And you can see Toby's nice little human hands, good for gripping a pencil or a hammer to build something, have now been modified. We have extended and elongated his finger bones to create the framework for his hand wing. In between is special stretchy skin, membrane skin. So this is characterized by being really flexible, very strong, and lightweight. It's perfect flight material. So when Toby decides to take to the air, he can extend his hand wings, and their hands, with the exception of their fingers being much longer, are designed, they're very similar to our own, the same bones, the same structure. So as he extends his wings and he starts to flap, He's pushing and capturing air and that's pushing him up. Okay, so that's achieving lift. But to change direction, because Tobes, did I forget to tell you this? You now are going to be eating bugs for every meal. Mm. Yeah, I thought you'd be excited. To be able to chase down a bug that's got really erratic flight path, bats have to be able to change direction really quickly. Finger flight lets you change the shape of your wing, which lets you change direction. So if Toby decides he has to chase a 
bug that's going like this, he can make tiny little adjustments with his finger bones, and that changes the shape of his wing and lets him hit his target easily. But wait a second. Lara, yeah. are we going to be seeing a lot of these bats during the day when we can see the bugs? We will not see bats during the day because they are nocturnal animals. So night that means active. they're sleeping during mm. the day, they're awake at night. This could be a problem because we humans hunt with our eyes. Mm -hmm. We use vision to find our target. So, Toby, how are you going to see in the dark? No, no. I, I agree. He's like, he's out of ideas. He's not <laughs> sure what to do. But you may notice something else is larger than it used to be. Here's the human ear. Here is the bat ear. This is giving us a big clue. When we see a sense organ on an animal that's way bigger than all the rest, that's giving you a clue that that animal will probably be using that sense the most. And with bats, this is true. We are looking at an incredible ability to navigate in the dark. Toby, can you do a silent scream for us? Right now, Toby <laughs> is screaming at bat level. So he's letting out an incredibly loud shriek that is so high pitched the human ear can't pick it up. But this sound wave is bouncing off things in the environment and it's getting picked up by his incredible ears. He can use these ears and sometimes they even have a nose flap that can also pick up the sound waves and they can echo locate, use sound waves to find an object. This means he can not only adjust his flight to catch an insect, he can actually use a type of sonar and sneezing to, get, to find his prey. And Lara, yeah. is it one or two bugs a night? Oh no, much more than that. It can be over a thousand for even a little tiny bat. Like in what, an, in one night? In one hour. What? <laughs> and what size of bug are we talking? We're talking tiny mosquito-sized bugs. And, and maybe mosquitoes in particular? Some oh, of them? Some of them, yes. <laughs> Bats are our friends. Now, I am going to let Toby turn back into a human kid. Thank you, Tobes, for helping us out. And I'm going to let Lara talk a little bit about the bat research she does here. We're talking about a very tiny creature that comes out only at night. So it's not necessarily easy to see. Lara, why don't you tell us some of the tools and some of the cool things that you're trying to find out about one of our bat species, a little brown bat? Of course. So one of the things that I'm working on is I'm looking at bat boxes. So rather than trying to explain what one is, I can show you guys what it looks like because we do have some here at the Calgary Zoo. So we have some on our Grazer's restaurant up there, and those ones actually have had bats inside them this summer. Now that's where bats will be sleeping during the summer months, during the day, and for female bats, it's also where they can give birth and look after their young. So bat boxes are really important in the reproductive cycle of bats. Now, where would they normally roost in nature if there weren't bat boxes around? Yeah, would so this still be a good site for them? I would still be a good site. Usually little brown bats, which are the species of bat we see in these bat boxes in southern Alberta, they'd normally be roosting in the hollows of old trees. We don't have too many out here in urbanized areas. That's because they're not as aesthetically pleasing and they can be a little bit dangerous, so we do remove them. But that's where bat boxes come in handy. Is we can use them instead of those trees in areas where we don't have them. But the zoo is such a good habitat for these bats that it is awesome that we have these boxes here. We have five of them on ground. So one of the questions we get a lot here is people want to know, this sounds great, bats eat bugs, mm -hmm. bugs are not something I'm fond of getting bitten by. How do I attract bats to my yard? And this is awesome that you want to be involved in this because of course this gives extra habitat for bats. You will get the pest control that they provide naturally, but they are kind of picky. So Lara's gonna tell you, because this is part of her research, what is it about a bat box? Is it the shape, the position, where do you put it? These are the ideas that we can help you out with. And we also have some resources to point you to. So go for it. Yeah, so for my research, I was basically looking at what characteristics of bat boxes bats actually like, because there's a ton of different designs out there, but we wanna be able to give these little guys the best chance of roosting in these areas. So I was looking at things like the color of the box, the height of it, its aspect, so what direction it was facing, how close it is to water or to shelter, and what the temperature of these boxes were. 
And then I took all these characteristics and I looked to see if a bat was actually in the box and I saw if there was a significant difference between occupied or unoccupied boxes that would let me know what characteristics they actually liked. And I did find a few cool things. So if you guys are looking to put up some bat boxes, I do have a few recommendations. One of them is that you live near a body of water. So here at the zoo, as Sarah mentioned, we have two rivers alongside us. So if you're living along a river or a lake or a pond, it's a great place for bats to get water or food. Also, you wanna have boxes that have multiple chambers. So when bats go inside the box, would you mind panning on over to that box up there? You can see there's a little slate along the bottom. So they actually climb up inside, up from the bottom. And inside, there can be multiple chambers in the box. So multiple chambers are better because it offers different temperatures for the bats to roost at. So if they get too hot, they can move to different chambers. Uh, the last thing that I recommend is that you put the box on a building or a tree rather than on a pole, as the poles don't provide as much shelter from aerial predators such as owls. They can also move a little bit in the wind. The trees and the buildings are much more secure. Now for these little brown bats, it's really important that we're looking after them right now because if you don't know, there is a fungus that has been spreading across North America, contributing to what is called white nose syndrome. And that has been causing catastrophic decreases in little brown bat populations. So here in Alberta, we don't have it yet, but we're taking strides to get ahead of it by trying to look at the populations of bats in Alberta and make, see what the numbers are at so we can help sustain them and monitor them if uh, white nose syndrome does reach Alberta. So we thought, just in case you're not convinced that bats are amazing, awesome, <laughs> and you definitely want them around, that we should give you a little bit of information on some of the things that they do for us yep. humans, all the different ways they help us. So part of what we're gonna do here is help you take a closer look, and when you come visit the zoo, this is something that we try to provide as many opportunities as possible. A chance for you to have a touch table where you literally learn with your fingertips. What we're gonna get our fabulous camera woman to do right now is take a close look. We're giving you a close up. Is it upside down? Sure. Yep. Would that be easier? <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. go. <laughs> so what you're looking at right now is a magnified uh, vision of a uh, sorry, a replica skull of a little brown bat. These are teeny weeny little critters. So you can imagine that's the skull size. And this is a, a body size that would be really about this big. They're really, really tiny. They have a very high metabolism. When you are small, you need more calories to keep that constant temperature. So we tend to find little tiny animals like shrews or mice or bats, they need to eat their body weight in food every day in order to have enough calories to keep that body temperature constant. So this is part of the reason why bats are such incredible pest control. They eat enormous numbers of insects. So that's mm -hmm. one teeny weeny little bug eating bat and that's the kind that we have here yep. but bats like I said earlier they are um, the second largest group of mammals so we have roughly 4,000 mammals we have what we're pushing 1300 bat species mm -hmm. at this point only the rodent order is larger okay so the flight part means that they can spread out they're living in all sorts of different habitats and they're all really super specialized if you visited the zoo in the past you may have seen bats that have a head shape more like this. This is a fruit bat. Large eye sockets because their prey isn't flying away. They need to spot the fruit. A longer nose. Fruit gives off a very strong fragrance to help attract animals to eat it because fruit is the way the plant gets an animal to do seed dispersal or spreading seeds around. Bats in rainforests are typically fruit-eating bats. Some of them are nectar-feeding or um, important pollinators as well. And basically, it works like this. The bat will come in, <laughs> eat, the, eat the fruit, and poop out the seed far away. Bat guano, or poop, is incredibly high in nitrogen, and it gives plants a great big boost. So they'll grow really, really fast with that as a fertilizer. In fact, you can buy bat guano in local gardening shops and it will really give your, your uh, garden a, a big kick to, to um, get those green leaves in particular growing. So what's one fun thing that bats pollinate that maybe we might enjoy? I know they pollinate a lot of things, but there's one thing in particular, Sarah. Oh, well, I think this is important for the adults mm -hmm. in the audience. So what we're trying to point out is without bats, 
you're going to have a lot more bugs, but you're also going to have a lot less food. Mm -hmm. A lot of our most important food crops are pollinated or have seed dispersal that comes from bat species. But there's also another type of food that we thought you guys might need to know about. Guys, if we don't have bats, rum and tequila will disappear. Yep. These yep. guys are important for um, the uh, sugarcane crops. And in fact, uh, there is a brand of rum you might recognize a bat symbol. So Bacardi recognized that bats are a hugely important part of the main crop that they make their product with. And they're a great example of a corporation that gives back to nature. They started the Luby Foundation for Louis Bacardi, and that's a great place to get more information about bats. They do all sorts of cool mm -hmm. research projects. They, um, the other place, of course, is looking at some of the tequila farmers are also recognizing that bats are integral to their uh, agave plants. And you can even nowadays, um, if you do tours, you can do, it's basically a combined bat and tequila tour. I've seen them on, on a few of the bat groups I belong to. They look really cool. So even the liquor store depends on bat species mm -hmm. to keep products on the shelves. We would literally have trouble feeding the human population without bat species around doing their incredibly important ecological jobs. Yeah. So maybe you don't want one in your backyard, but you gotta give thanks where thanks are due. Are, are we pretty close to being able to take some questions? I'm just going to check in. Are yeah. we getting any questions that people have yet? No, not yet. Okay, so what we'll do is the next part that we wanted to offer is trying to do some bat myth busting for you. Yep. I almost said bat busting myths. That's not <laughs> what we want to do. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to put out the myth and Lara is going to bust it for All right. you. All right. Okay, ready. Bats get stuck in your hair? Bats do not get stuck in your hair. As someone who has been close to many bats who are flying around me, they can use echolocation to pick up things that are very, very small. Plus your hair is attached to your whole head. They're not gonna fly into your hair. In fact, we think the origin of that myth is partly because humans attract bugs. Mm -hmm. We give off carbon dioxide and heat, which are two things that bugs like mosquitoes are using to find us. Yep. So if you were to look above the heads of people around a campfire, you usually will see swarms. So if you're seeing bats doing this over top of your head, it's not because they're looking to get snarled in your hair. Mm -hmm. Why would a bat want to do that? No, what they're doing is saying, thank you, human, you've brought in a few tasty treats for me, and they're taking advantage of a food source. Oh, yeah. So we think that is probably the origin of that myth. And if you take a look at the um, consistency of my hair, I think you will recognize that if they were going to get caught in anyone's hair, it would be mine, and it doesn't <laughs> happen. So we're, we're there good. You go. We have one question from our audience so far. Um, Carlene wants to know, why do bats hang upside down? Ooh. Ah, excellent question. All right. This is an important little piece of, uh, we call it a bio fact. It's come from a living creature. So you're looking at the skeleton of a big brown bat here. I believe it's big brown. Um, now I want you to notice the bigger, heavier bones are all at the top here because for locomotion, this bat has to support really big flight muscles. Their body looks a lot like ours, except when we look at where the um, musculature is and the bone structure is for locomotion, you're gonna see some big differences. So if Lara and I are walking around, we are using our big, huge muscles in our yep. bum and our thighs, and these really large muscles, or sorry, uh, bones, are there to support those big muscles for walking, because that's how we move. For bats, they're moving in flight. Now that means, it's really top heavy. So it's way uh, easier for them to drop into flight and they have locking mechanisms. So um, if we were to look at our hand, uh, you, you let your hand just sort of relax, that's your natural at rest state. For a bat, that is a natural at rest state. They have to think and consciously go, oh, I'm gonna release now. So the opposite um, design helps them hang and sleep without having to think about keeping a muscle contracted. That's the natural position, the rest position. But it uh, has a lot to do with the, where the flight muscles are situated. So this means if they were to try to support their weight on their feet, they topple over. They're, they're way too top heavy. But this is also a great way to get quickly into flight. And um, they've, their, their design and their behavior has selected for each other yep. over time. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Lara, you ready? Okay, ready. 
are bats more likely to give somebody a human rabies? So any mammal can potentially give you rabies. Bats have a really low incidence of rabies and you would only get it if you were handling bats and like any other wildlife, you shouldn't be handling them unless you are a researcher like myself or you have experience. So if you do find an injured bat, uh, it's best to call somebody who would be able to pick it up um, rather than trying to handle it yourself because there is always a chance and safety is number one, but it is a very low incidence of rabies in bats. And on that note, any wildlife, if you are, um, in, if you do have an encounter that results in a bite of any sort, mm -hmm. never take a chance. Just go and report it and get checked out and go see a doctor. It's just yep. the best practice at all times. So we're always thinking safety first. The incidence is really tiny, but just make sure it's not even there. So yep. go and we always say that, go and, and do the safest thing. Yep. Um, we got another question. Uh, Carlene also wants to know, what is the biggest bat? Oh, we are looking at one of the, one of the flying, flying foxes. foxes. Okay, so you're yeah. at the um, the same shape, the ones that look like a little dog face here because they've got the long, long nose for sniffing and the big mm -hmm. eyes. So uh, Malayan flying fox is the ones that we used to have here just a few years ago. Um, they are the second largest species, and I'm trying to remember the name of the largest because there actually was contention. We keep discovering new bat species. Mm -hmm. um, this is when we may have to do a quick double check and mm -hmm. get back to you yep. because I think Malayan flying fox was considered the largest and then we've discovered, I'm trying I to remember which one. more knowledge on our little Albertan bats yeah. that are quite <laughs> tiny than the big ones. <laughs> the big size, um, higher energy foods like fruit, lots of sugar in there those are the larger size bats or typically that's their diet so they need to be in a place where there's fruit available year round so you're only finding these guys in tropical areas not in a temperate place where it's snowy no our bats are very small okay um stephanie would like to know who do you report an injured bat to um it's the alberta wildlife Actually, there's, so there are a couple. There's a like Calgary Wildlife Center. There's an Alberta Wildlife Center. If you, you can Google those names super easy. And they have people who volunteer to drive out and pick up animals for you. You can take them to their centers. Yeah, those are the two. Um, the two big ones in, that are local. In this, in this yeah. area. And um, part of the reason we're hesitating is that there's actually a number of other ones throughout the province. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, throughout provinces and states, it's usually local chapters of various organizations, just people with a lot of animal handling skills um, and veterinary backgrounds that have put these charitable organizations together to, to help out our local wildlife. So uh, it really does vary. Yes. It's a great thing. Um, I would recommend because we're, it, it's likely, you know, in your lifetime that you'll see an injured wildlife. It's mm -hmm. a, a great one to have like written down in your glove box, in your car, or even just one that you put on your phone. So th there are several, but I would say um, Calgary Wildlife Rehab and, and Alberta Institute for Wildlife is also, yes. yeah, those two are really good. Perfect. Um, David would like to know how many years bats live for? Uh, it can depend on the species, but for our little brown bats that we have here in Alberta, I know that one of the uh, longest recorded lifespans was 40 years. So for these bats, they tend to return to places where they roost. So if you do put up a bat box, chances are you're gonna get females that are all related coming back to the same box year after year, which is pretty cool. It's really remarkable too that we usually associate larger body size in animals with longer lifespans. Yep. And bats are a really good example of an exception to the rule there yes. for sure. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Why don't we say that um, we would like to also give people one more opportunity to dive deeper into bats. They're such a cool group of animals. Two really great organizations that we want to give a shout out to because that's where we turn all the time for the latest research, uh, really great papers. They're very science-based. They really do their, their homework. There is a local one, and we want to tell about this one because Lara's worked with them a bit. She knows lots of them are, are uh, science pals of hers. Yeah. They are also big proponents of citizen science. So this is a chance for you, even if you don't have a science degree, you've got powers of observation, you can count. So you have a way that you could contribute to everything from bat research to um, looking at uh, really cool, um, what we call a, um, a like a printout of, of the 
voice ways they do for echolocation. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of really interesting things there. So this is the first one, local group. It's the Alberta Community Bat Program. Yes. They're really awesome, a great source of info, but also really cool uh, activities that you might be able to get involved with. And then the big international one is Bat Conservation International, and they do fabulous work all over the world. And they are also, again, science-based, advocating for um, leaving space for wildlife and how you can make sure that bats and humans can coexist really well. Thank so, you so much yeah. for joining thank us you today. This is really exciting for us. And of course, we also want to say thank you to all of our Calgary Zoo supporters and for your passion for wildlife. And thank you for supporting wildlife conservation.